The Iliad by Homer Translated by Michael Human. Acknowledgements I would like to thank the administrators, board members, and my fellow faculty members at Imperial Valley College in Imperial, California for giving me the time and support to complete this endeavor. I would also like to thank my siblings, Virginia Kearney and Douglas Human, for all of their love and encouragement. To my parents-in-law, Joseph and Carolyn Krejcik, thank you for all of your love and support over the years. To my wife, Caroline, thank you for putting up with me for over three decades. I could not have done this without you. I love you, dear. Finally, I would like to dedicate this work to the memory of my parents, Ronald and Rosemary Human. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for everything. Introduction if the Trojan War ever took place, then it probably happened on or around 1180 BCE. This is the tail end of the Late Bronze Age, just before most of the major Mediterranean civilizations, including the Hittite, Assyrian, Babylonian, and Mycenaean, were wiped out by a combination of natural catastrophes, internal strife, and invasion from a group known from history only as the Sea Peoples. One consequence of the collapse of these civilizations is that there are very few written records from the subsequent centuries. It is not until the 8th and 7th centuries BCE that the earliest writings from Greece and western Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, appeared, including and especially the two works attributed to Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which were written down sometime around 750 BCE but based upon an oral tradition that extended back centuries. In the ancient world, there was no question that the Trojan War was a real event. This is particularly true for the Romans, who claimed to be descended from the Trojan Aeneas, who supposedly survived the war and went on to lead a group of exiled Trojans to Italy, where they eventually founded Rome. This story is retold in the Aeneid by Virgil, who wrote his epic during the reign of the first Roman emperor Augustus, 27 BC to 14 AD. During this time, Troy still existed, albeit in less regal terms than it did in the Bronze Age, and Augustus himself made a pilgrimage to Troy, as did his uncle, Julius Caesar, the later Roman emperor Hadrian, and the Persian king Xerxes the first. No doubt, each of these men looked at Troy and imagined himself as Achilles or Hector battling for ten long years over the most beautiful women in the world, over the most beautiful woman in the world. In fact, Troy remained inhabited until about 600 CE, when it was finally abandoned. And from that point until the 17th century, the general assumption among scholars and intellectuals was that Troy and the Trojan War were just myths, not based on any historical facts, but simply a product of Homer's imagination. This view changed in the Victorian era when businessmen and amateur archaeologists, or antiquarians as they were then known, like Frank Calvert and Heinrich Schliemann, visited Turkey in search of the mythic Troy. Calvert was the first to identify a particular hilly area a few miles south of the Dardanelles, called Hisorlik, as the most likely site of ancient Troy. He did not have enough money to do a proper excavation, but he shared his ideas with the wealthy Schleiman, who set about excavating the site, using dynamite to help dig down through many layers of archaeological finds until he reached what he thought was the original Troy of King Priam. However, what he thought was Priam's Troy is actually now called Troy I, and there are at least eight other Troys each on top of the other, that can be clearly identified above Troy 1, along with dozens of sublayers. 
Excavations have continued to explore and analyze the various layers of Troy, and the general consensus among experts is that Troy 6 or Troy 7 are most likely to have been inhabited during the periods most closely associated with the Trojan War, approximately 1200 BCE. So Troy itself was real, but what of the war? A number of finds discovered at Troy, such as pottery and figurines, bear similarities to items found in Mycenaean sites in Greece. More interestingly, however, are a number of ancient Hittite administrative manuscripts that mention a Willusa, which is very similar to Ilios, the name Homer regularly uses for Troy, and where the Iliad gets its name and one of the documents mentions a treaty between King Muwatalali II and Alexandru of Walusa, the latter name being tantalizingly similar to Alexander, or Paris, of Alois. There is another document called the Tawagalawawa letter, which is a correspondence between a Hittite king and a king from a land called Ayawa, and in this letter, there is a mention that these two kings had once fought over Willusa. Scholars suspect that the Iowaya is a reference to some part of Mycenaean Greece, and thus could possibly be a direct reference to the Trojan War. Villing, Fitton, Donnellan, Shapland, 177 to 179. In short, there is some historical evidence suggesting the Trojan War might have taken place. However, this is by no means definitive proof, and it is highly unlikely that we will ever truly know for certain if the war that Homer depicts actually took place or not. But what of Homer himself? What do we know? As with Troy and the Trojan War, most people in the ancient world had no doubt that Homer was a real person, while some ancient commentators believed Homer was an eyewitness to the events of the Trojan War. Most believed that he was a blind poet who was born on Chios, a Greek island off the coast of Anatolia, though several other sites, including Athens, also made their own claims, and lived between 850 and 750 BCE. Further, Ancient scholars generally believed Homer wrote not just the Iliad and Odyssey, but a whole slew of other epics about the Trojan War and its aftermath, along with a variety of other works, including the works commonly referred to as the Homeric hymns. Side note 1. The poet of the Hymn to Apollo, who was in classical times thought to be Homer, describes himself as a blind man who lives in rocky Chios, Homeric hymns 85. Chios was also the base for the Homeridae, a well-known guild of rhapsodies, the title for poets, performers, who would recite Homer's epics. Continuing. However, today much of this is considered suspect. In fact, the Homeric question, the question of who Homer was, where he came from, or even if he existed in the first place, has dominated a subset of academic scholarship for centuries. The current assumption among experts is that Homer was not a single individual. Since archaeologic, linguistic, and geographic evidence in the Iliad and the Odyssey point to the likely conclusion that the two works were not written by the same person. Further, the epics are almost certainly the end products of an oral tradition, meaning that the Homer who wrote these works was most likely putting into writing stories that had existed in oral form for centuries. The epics themselves actually help support this last point, since both the Odyssey and Iliad contain detailed descriptions of both Bronze Age and Iron Age armor and other technologies. For example, boars, tusk helmets, and other weapons and armor that were known to exist in the Bronze Age circa 1200 BCE are described alongside references to armor, weapons, and sailing equipment that were not developed until the Iron Age in 8th century or later. This suggests that the final written form that the epics took combined centuries-old knowledge of weapons and armor from the Bronze Age, information no doubt handed down from one singer to another with contemporary technologies that would have been known and understood by Iron Age audiences. Ultimately, though, 
all of this is speculation. All we really know for certain is what can be found within the two epics ascribed to Homer. But that is plenty. After all, the Iliad and Odyssey have been the foundational works of not only Greek culture, but Western culture for thousands of years, and they have spawned countless retellings and reimaginings in all forms of art. From paintings and sculpture, to poetry and plays, to novels and movies. There are many aspects of the Trojan War that have become common knowledge for much of the Eastern Western world. The Judgment of Paris, Helen of Troy, the face that launched 1,000 ships, the Trojan horse, Achilles' heel, and so forth. For first-time readers of Homer's Iliad, it comes as a shock to learn how few of these are present in the work itself. Although the Trojan War is said to have lasted 10 years, Homer's Iliad focuses on only a few weeks in the final year of the war, though not significantly the end itself or the sacking of Troy. The epic begins when Agamemnon, the Mycenaean, Mycenaean king and commander of the Achaean Greek army, spurns the entreaties of Chryseis, a priest of Apollo, who seeks the return of his daughter, Chrysisius, who was captured during a raid and given to Agamemnon to serve as his concubine. Chryseis then prays to Apollo, asking for retribution, and Apollo complies, sending a plague to the Archaean camp that decimates the army. After nine days, Achilles, the greatest Archaean fighter, calls a war cabinet to determine what must be done. A seer, Caucus, says what everyone already knew. The plague was Agamemnon's fault, and in order to end the plague he needs to return the priest's daughter and offer tribute to Apollo. Agamemnon at first refuses, and Achilles insolent, and Achilles criticizes him for his foolishness. Enraged by Achilles' insolent behavior, Agamemnon insults Achilles back. Eventually, Agamemnon does agree to give up Chryseis, but only after insisting that Achilles surrender Briseis, his own concubine, to him. Furious at this turn of events, Achilles declares that he will no longer fight for the Archaeans. He retreats to his tents and asks his mother, the nymph Theotius, to go to Zeus and persuade him to punish the Achaeans for Agamemnon's treatment of him. She does this, and Zeus agrees. All this happens in Book 1. For the next 14 books, the will of Zeus plays out as he promised. The Trojans eventually decimate the Achaeans until they reach the ships and are ready to set them on fire. Even at the point when his own ships are threatened, however, Achilles refuses to return to battle. And in Book 16, however, he allows his best friend, Patroclus, to wear Achilles' armor and lead the Myrmidians the Myrmidians into battle to force the Trojans to retreat. This Patroclus does to remarkable effect. The Trojans do indeed flee back to the walls of Troy. However, Patroclus gets greedy and chases after them, and as a result he is killed by Hector, oldest son of King Priam of Troy, heir to the kingdom of Troy, and commander of the Trojan forces. Achilles becomes enraged at Hector for killing his friend and vows to destroy him, and so Achilles does, though not before also killing many other Trojans along the way. And after Hector's death, Achilles refuses to relinquish Hector's body to his family, treating it with contempt by dragging it behind his chariot around the city walls. Eventually, King Priam goes to Achilles' tent to beg the warrior to return his son to him, and Achilles agrees, and Hector is buried. This is where the Iliad ends. We do not see the death of Achilles, which is foretold on numerous occasions in Homer's work, or the Trojan horse or the sack of Troy. There is, however, a good reason for this. Homer's Iliad, along with Homer's other epic, the Odyssey, are part of a cycle of epics focusing on the Trojan War, each one telling a piece of the story. Sadly, only summaries and fragments of the others have survived to present day though we know enough about them to know that none of the other works were a match for Homer's artistry. One of the reasons Homer's epics survived and the others did not. In all, the cycle contained eight epics. 1. Cypria, 
11 books long, focusing on events leading up to the Trojan War, like the Judgment of Paris, the abduction of Helen, the marshalling of the Achaean fleet, and the first nine years of the war. 2. Iliad, 24 books long. 3. Aethiopis, 5 books long, focusing on events after Hector's funeral up to the death of Achilles. 4. Little Iliad, 4 books long focusing on events after Achilles' death, the awarding of Achilles' armor to Odysseus, the suicide of Telamonian Ajax, and the building of the Trojan horse. 5. The Sack of Troy, two books long, focusing on the destruction of the Trojan city and its people. 6. Nostoi, or Return, five books, focusing on the return home of the Achaeans, other than Odysseus and includes the murder of Agamemnon and the wanderings of Menelaus and Helen, both of which are also described in the Odyssey. 7. The Odyssey, 24 books long. 8. Telegoni, 2 books long, focusing on further adventures of Odysseus and his death at the hands of Telegonus, his illegitimate son, who was born to Circe after Odysseus visited her island. Side note 2. One of the main sources of evidence for this epic cycle comes from the preface to a 10th century CE manuscript of the Iliad that is referred to by scholars as Venetis A. Additionally, Aristotle mentions the Cypria and Little Iliad in his Poetics, 1459, though mainly to complain that they are inferior to Homer's works. While the Iliad and Odyssey do not provide a full narrative, account of the Trojan War. They do provide us detailed studies of its major participants. However, readers new to Homer are often perplexed by the mindsets and behavior of these Bronze Age men, particularly Agamemnon and Achilles. Why, for example, is Agamemnon so furious when he told when he when told that he must give back Chryseis? Why does Achilles go to such great lengths to avenge on Agamemnon's words and actions? In order to understand why the characters behave the way that they do, it is important to understand three important Greek words, Cleos, Time, and Jairus. In Book 12 of the Iliad, Sarpedon, son of Zeus and leader of the Lycians, who fought for the Trojans, tells his comrade Glaucus, Friend, if we fled this fight and were able to live forever, being ageless and immortal, then I would not fight among the finest, nor would I send you to win glory in battle. But now the goddess of death is all around us, and since no mortal can escape or avoid it, let us go and gain glory, or give it to another. In these lines, Sarpedon crystallizes the Greek concept of Cleos, which roughly translates as fame, glory, or honor as in something that brings fame or honor or confers distinction. Cleos is different from the English idea of honor, however, for it is related to the Greek word to hear, suggesting that honor embodied by the words Cleos is not merely the honors that a person may receive, like the honor of winning a Nobel Prize, but the honor of being spoken about by others. Unlike the gods, mortals die and the only way to become immortal is to be remembered and talked about after one's death, by venturing into the fighting, either to become a victor or victim. Sarpedon can become part of a song that will live on forever, which indeed is what happens. Living on in the songs of those who came after you was at the existential heart of Bronze Age warrior culture, the ultimate justification for their actions. In everyday life, however, two other components were at least of equal importance, time and garros. Garros is a prize given during the division of spoils after a raid or battle, and time is the honor granted to warriors from receiving that prize. Hence, garros is the physical embodiment of a warrior's time. The more garros, the greater the time. These two concepts are at the core of Achilles' rage. Briseis is Achilles' Geras, and her presence in his camp 
as his slave was the embodiment of his time, his honor and reputation. And when Agamemnon takes her from Achilles, he is not simply taking Achilles' concubine. He is taking his time. Once Achilles loses this time, he loses the motivation to fight. This is revealed to us in Book 9. Agamemnon sends a group of leaders to Achilles' tent to beg him to return to the fight, offering not only the return of Briseis, but numerous other tributes as well. Achilles, however, rejects the offer out of hand. In explaining this rejection, Achilles details the effect Agamemnon's insult has had on his desire to fight. An equal fate awaits both the coward holding back and the hero fighting hardest, and death comes both to the idle man and the busy. It has not brought me profit for my heart to suffer by always risking my life in battle. Agamemnon can offer Achilles all the garros in the world, but those promised prizes are not enough for Achilles, for they do not make up for the time he lost in the first place. Moreover, the fact that Agamemnon took away Achilles' garros means that any promise of future garros is suspect. What does it matter if Agamemnon offers half his kingdom to Achilles, if, as in the case of Briseis, those prizes can be taken back? Why risk one's life for time that can be stripped away at a moment's notice? Another concept central both to the Iliad and to Bronze Age culture in general is Xenia, which roughly translates as guest friendship. During this period, when a guest or stranger, Xenos, comes to a person's house, that person becomes the host's friend, and the host is obligated to provide numerous accommodations based upon particular rituals. In turn, the stranger promises to return the generous offers of friendship. This friendship does not end at the death of the host or stranger. Either the sons and grandsons of both men would be honor-bound to maintain this alliance. The Oxford Classical Dictionary notes that, in guest friendships, friends provided services analogs, analogous to those provided by bankers, lawyers, hotel owners, insurers, and others today. A host offered a guest a place to stay, gifts in the form of money or commerce, and assistance with any legal or tax issues that might have brought the visitor to this new place. A window to, into Xenia can be found in Book 6, when Diomedes of Argos meet Glaucus of Lycia in battle. As is the custom in numerous occasions in the Iliad, the two talk to one another before engaging in battle. In this case, Glaucus mentions his heroic ancestor, Bellophron, and hearing this, Diomedes exclaims, Then you are a friend of my father's house, for noble Onius once hosted blame, blameless Bellerophon in his great hall for twenty days. Recognizing a guest friendship between their paternal grandfathers suddenly makes Glaucus not an enemy into battle, but a long-lost friend. Diomedes expands on this later. So now I am your host when you are in Argos, and you to me in Lycia when I visited the land. Let us leave our spears, even in this throng. There are other Trojans and their allies to slay, either sent by the gods or overcome by foot, and many Achaeans for you to slay, if you can. And let us exchange armor, so others may know we are guest friends from our father's days. From here, Diomedes and Glaucus swap armor and go away from battle to talk more about their shared Xenia. On the opposite end of Xenia is the event that precipitated the Trojan War itself. Paris was a guest friend of Menelaus in Sparta when he abducted Helen and took numerous prizes from Melanus's palace. This grave violation of Xenia was seen as an offense to both mortals and gods, for to violate Xenia was to offend Zeus himself. This offense instigated the war, and it is recalled numerous times throughout the Iliad, right up to the end. In Book 24, Zeus, 
through his messenger, Iris, tells Priam to visit Achilles' tent and beg for his son's body. Zeus assures Priam that he would be safe from harm in this endeavor because Achilles, unlike Paris, respects the gods and abides by their laws. And after he has arrived in Achilles' tent, neither Achilles nor anyone else will kill him. For the man is not foolish, impulsive, or sinful, and will kindly protect a suppliant man. Hence, although the Iliad does not end with the sacking of Troy, it does end with a symbolic reconciliation between Hector and Priam, and between mortals and immortals. Translator's Note In his work on the translation of Homer, the great Victorian art critic, Matthew Arnold stated, the, translation, the translator of Homer should above all be penetrated by a sense of four qualities of his author, that he be eminently rapid, that he is eminently plain and direct both in the evolution of his thought and in the expression of it, that is, both in his syntax and in his words, that he is eminently plain and direct in the substance of his thought that is, in his matter and ideas, and, finally, that he is eminently noble. Does this translation of Homer's Iliad possess all four of these qualities? Is it a swift read that uses plain and direct language, and tells the story in a straightforward manner while maintaining the nobility and epic quality of the original? That is not for me to say. I can say, however, that although this translation has the same number of lines as Homer's original, 15,693. It was not my intention to create a literal line-for-line -line translation. Instead, I wanted to strike a balance between staying as close as possible to Homer's original Greek, while still maintaining English syntax and overall readability, especially for first-time readers like myself. If these two things were in conflict with one another, that is, if staying close to the Greek meant making the translation more difficult to understand, then I generally sided with readability. A small example of this occurs in Book 16, lines 139-144, to 144, which describes Patroclus, Achilles' closest companion, arming for battle. First, here is the passage in Homer's original Greek. In Samuel Butler's 1898 translation, the passage reads, He grasped two redoubtable spears that suited his hands, but he did not take the spear of noble Achilles, so stout and strong, for none other than of the Achaeans could wield it, though Achilles could do so easily. This was the ashen spear from Mount Pelion, Pelion which Chiron had cut upon a mountain top and had given to Peleus, wherewith to deal out death among heroes. In the Loeb classical edition of the Iliad, translated into prose by A.T. Murray in 1924 and revised by William F. Wyatt in 1999, the passage reads, And he took two valiant spears that fitted his grasp. Only the spear of the incomparable son of Achaeus he took not. The spear, heavy and huge and strong, this no other of the Achaeans could wield, but Achilles alone was skilled to wield it. The Pelian spear of ash that Cherion had given to his dear father from the peak of Pelion to be used for the slaying of warriors. In Richard Lattimore's 1951 poetic translation, the passage reads, He took up two powerful spears that fitted his hand's grip. Only he did not take the spear of blameless Achilles, huge, heavy, thick, which no one else of all the Achaeans could handle. But Achilles alone knew how to wield it. The Pelian ash spear which Cherion had brought to his father from high on Pelion to be death for fighters. In Robert Fagel's more modernized poetic translation from 1990, the passage reads, and he took two rugged spears that fit his grip, and Achilles' only weapon Patroclus did not take was the great man's spear, weighted, heavy, though. No other Achaean fighter could heft that shaft. Only Achilles had the skill to wield it well. Pelian ash it was, a gift to his father, Peleus, presented by Chiron, once 
hewn on Pelion's crest to be the death of heroes. In Stanley Lombardo's 1997 translation, it reads, He took two spears of the proper heft, but left behind the massive battle pike of Achaeus, his incomparable grandson. No one but Achilles could handle this spear, made of ash, which the centaur Chiron had brought down from Mount Pelion and given to Achilles' father to be the death of heroes. Finally, in this translation, the passage reads, Finally, he took two strong spears that fit his grasp, but left the large, heavy, and powerful spear of Achaeus' noble grandson, for no other Achaean was skilled enough to wield it but Achilles. An ashen spear from Pelion's peak that Chiron gave his dear father, a gift for slaying heroes. There are 44 words in the original Greek passage, 66 in Butler's, 71 in the Loeb Classical Edition, 62 in Lattimore, 67 in Fables, 51 in Lombardo, and 52 in this translation. In other words, this translation is shorter than all but Lombardo's and closer in length to the original. That does not, however, mean this translation is more accurate, merely more economical. Lattimore's translation hews extremely close to the Greek original. Each line corresponds more or less to the original Greek line. Most of the other translations are also fairly consistent within the Greek, in that they maintain the basic line-by-line -line structure, and include much of the repetition found in the original. This translation, like Lombardo's, eliminates some of the repetition that works in Homer's original, but reads awkwardly in English, and rearranges some word order to improve clarity and readability. For example, the first line is basically identical in each translation. Petrocrolus picked up two spears. The next few lines of the other translations mostly follow the Greek. First noting that Petrocrolus did not take Achilles' spear, then noting that the spear's length and weight and the fact that of all the Achaeans only Achilles could wield such a weapon. This translation includes all of this information, but reverses the order a bit. Putting the large, heavy, and powerful aspects of the spear ahead of the owner's name. This change was made for the sake of readability, because putting the description of the spear, the reasons why Patrocrolus did not pick it up, in the third line and not the second, renders it an awkward afterthought between the two mentions of Achilles, rather than the crucial piece of information that it actually is. Similarly, in the end of the original Greek passage, Mount Pelion is mentioned twice wants to describe the type of wood the spear is made from, and again to identify where the famous centaur Chiron, presumably, made the weapon. Most of the other translations also mention Pelion twice, but this translation, like Lattimore's and Lombardo's, only mentions it once and rearranges the order a bit by mentioning Mount Pelion before Chiron. Again, this is done for brevity, taking several pieces of information from the original naming the spear, identifying where the weapon came from, identifying it as a gift from Chiron to Peleus, and noting its use to kill heroes, and combining them in a clear and simple manner. There are a few pieces of information not found in the original that are added by some of the translations. First, Homer's original does not state outright that Chiron made the weapon. It merely states that it came from Mount Pelion, and was given to Peleus by Chiron. However, Butler's translation notes that Chiron had cut the weapon on the mountain, and the Fagel's translation notes the weapon was hewn on the mountain. The other translations, mine included, leave this information out. Likewise, Homer does not, in this passage, state that Chiron is a centaur, but this fact is included in Lombardo's translation. This added information certainly helps those who might not know who Chiron is, but since it was not included in the original Greek, I left it out, as did the other translations I cited. Chiron was previously named in Book 6 and 11, and in Book 11, Chiron is indeed identified as a centaur. Hence, the repetition of the information, while helpful, was not, in my mind, necessary. There is, however, another reason why I did not think adding centaur to this passage was necessary. 
Unlike all the other translations mentioned above, my translation was written in the 21st century, in the age of Google and Wikipedia. Facts like this one are just a click away. In fact, I have included links to Wikipedia articles on most of the character and place names mentioned throughout the epic. I only added these links at the first mention of each name, so the link to the Wikipedia page on Chiron can be found in Book 6, but not in the subsequent mentions of that centaur. For those not reading the book digitally, I have also included a standard glossary of people and places at the end. The information in the glossary is obviously not as comprehensive as that found online, but it should suffice for most readers. The names used in this translation are the ones Homer uses, and Homer's use of names can be tricky. Not only does Homer use different names to describe the same person or the same people, but he also regularly substitutes names with patrionomics, son of, or epithets, like oxide. Homeric names can form to Indo-European patterns, one name only for men and women, but a patrionomic like son of Atreus used in public. Men were usually son of their father, but often married women were referred to as wife of. Helen, for example, is referred to as wife of Paris, though Paris was also referred to as husband of Helen which is considered an insult to the last liked character in the Iliad to the least liked character in the Iliad and since greek uses a different alphabet than english individual and place names in homer are spelled in a variety of ways depending upon the translation and many modern translations utilize spelling that adhere closer to the Greek original words rather than Latinized names of the past. For example, in Richard Lattimore's translation, Achilles is spelled Achilles, closer to the Greek original. Ajax is Ias, Hector is Hector, and so on. For this translation, I have decided to stick to the more common spellings of names in order to make the readings of this work as simple as possible, particularly for students new to Homer, like me. All, almost without exception. These are the spellings found in both A.T. Murray's Loeb, classical translation, and the translation of Robert Fagel's. Hence, in my translation, Achilles is Achilles, Ajax is Ajax, and Hector is Hector. With all this in mind, here are a few additional notes to make reading easier. Homer never refers to the Greeks as Greek. They are instead called Achaeans, Argives, Danans, Hellenines, or Panhellenines. Their most common epithets are well-grieved or of the hollowed ships. Side note 1. A full list of all epithets can be found at this Wikipedia link. The Trojans are generally called Trojans, but Troy itself is often referred to as Ilios or Ilium or Ilion. The most common epithets used for the Trojans is tamers of horses. Achilles is often described as son of Peleos, and he is also described as swift-footed and godlike. Agamemnon and his brother Menelaus are both sons of Atreus. Agamemnon as the high king of the Achaeans, is called ruler of many lands, ruler of men, and lord of men, among others. Menelaus is called great shouter, or dear to Ares, god of war. No one has more epithets than Odysseus, but the most common are wise, clever, cunning, and resourceful. Paris is generally called Alexander, and only occasionally Paris. Numerous mortals are referred to as godlike, including Achilles, Odysseus, Helen, and Agamemnon, while others are called beloved of Zeus, child of Zeus, or dear to Zeus. Among the gods, Apollo is described as Phobius, the bright or pure, free shooter, or sharpshooter. Zeus goes by many names, but the most common are son of Kronos, cloud gatherer, loud thundering, and far seeing. 
Hera is often ox-eyed and white-armed. Athena is daughter of Zeus, Pallas, and owl-eyed, and Aphrodite is fair, heavenly, and golden.